BBC Radio Scotland. Hello, I'm Mark Watson. This is a download from the BBC. For terms and conditions, please go to www.bbc.co.uk slash Radio Scotland. Hey Podbods, what a podcast we have for you this week. What a podcast. I'm talking fast because this week is all killer, no filler, and I'm definitely the least interesting thing on it. So coming up, we've got Ben Elton, David Mitchell, Keith Lemon, Des O'Connor, John Lloyd, and of course, Mr. Fred McCauley. And here he is, telling you lies about the MTV Europe Awards. Nicki Minaj. Uh, Nicki, Nicki Minaj, I think, was a felony uh, in Glasgow for people that stole from her. Why are you saying it like an Aberdonian? <laughs> Nick, Nicki Minaj. <laughs> Nicki Minaj. I, I believe she's from Ellen, isn't she? Uh-huh. She's from Trinidad and Tobago, because, that's where she's from. You know, that, that Calvin Harris, he's he's from down, down the road, <laughs> Dum, Dumfries. From Dumfries. Uh-huh. Nicki Minaj, right. Ellen, and uh, she used to play the Scout Hut at uh, Haddo House. Is that right? M and M, M M and M. Right, he's for Dundee. M M M and M. M. He'll be down your supermarket, <laughs> maybe at the pub. We were wall to wall in comedy legends here at BBC Radio Scotland this week. First up, here's Des O'Connor with a first-hand account on his mythical performance at the Glasgow Empire. But and comedy's <laughs> always been there in in your life, hasn't it? Well, I went to Glasgow Empire in 1954. <laughs> I was going to ask if that was true. <laughs> it's absolutely true. I did faint with fear. Uh-huh. I mean, no one told me that the national sport in Scotland in those days was to go to the Empire on a Friday Boarding night. the English comics. And wait for the English comic. Nobody told me. Uh, and I'm halfway through it, I'm like, oh, I can't deal with this. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to throw a faint. Uh-huh. And I went down in a heap. And I remember, the I think the MD's name was Tommy McCracken. Right. If any of his relatives are around or listening, they uh-huh. may know. And I remember him pulling his hands up to the footlights, leaning over the footlights and saying, is this in the act? <laughs> I said, I fainted out of the side of my mouth. And they dragged me off through the back of the curtains. Uh-huh. And I remember Eric Morgan for years later said that I was the only comic that ever sold advertising space on the soles of his shoes. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Des and Mel. That was a great, great well, program. The beautiful Mel Sykes. She was, she's adorable, but she's as nutty as a fruitcake. Uh-huh. And she laughs like a drain and, and occasionally talks like a sailor. Yes, I was going to say, I suspect there was a bit of mischief well, there just was. off camera there. Was there I not? remember once with her, and I, don't worry, I won't shock anyone listening because I know it's live, but I remember once she was telling me about it. She used to get, we called them Mel's moments. Right. They wouldn't, she would say things, you think, how could she say that? There was one, she was telling me that, um, I'm not sure which one to tell her, there's so many <laughs> All right, this one, she said, there's a big, there's a, a kind of a, the equivalent of a state fair in Gloucester, and the farmer was showing off his animals, and he painted his bulls red, uh-huh. and she got that wrong. Well, I tell you, <laughs> we laughed nonstop for five minutes. None of us could say a word. We, even the cameraman were laughing. Uh-huh. I, I had to get one of the camera guys uh-huh. to read the next link because we couldn't just do it. It's not all about the laughs on the podcast this week. Here's Ben Elton reflecting on one of the sadder events in the comedy world this year. One of the first shows uh, Mrs. Macaulay and I saw at the Fringe was yourself, Andy De La Tour, and, and the Rick. King, and yeah. the King. The man what a sad I, year it's been. Man, I always called the King. Yeah, I, I, if anyone had said to me New Year's Day this will be the year we bury Rick, I, I, I would have obviously been yeah. beyond beyond consoling and t- utterly stunned because nobody expected it. Um, it he, he had a heart attack completely out of the blue. Mm-hmm. And so it was a genuine, like one of those shock bereavements where it takes quite a long time to adjust. I miss him every day. Of course, I'm, you know, his family are, are obviously in all our hearts. Mo, but and how are the family doing? Very well. Uh, we, we, Barbara is a magnificent woman and she organised, she helped us all through the bereavement. Oh, I know yeah. she felt, Aid felt very much that she, she helped him and, and certainly me. She organised a wonderful funeral at, her, at their home in mm-hmm. Devon. Uh, Rick was fortunate, uh, Rick was, his family were fortunate to be able to have him buried in their, on their land. So right. we all sat on a hillside where, where my dear, dear old friend lies, and we sat there for many, many hours as the sun set. I, mm-hmm. I carried, you know, Aid and I and a few of us, I carried the coffin up the hill, and I was very privileged to be able to speak over the grave. And um, 
Yeah, it, it was, a, you know, I'm very fortunate. I've, I've suffered very few real mm -hmm. bereavements in my life, but that was a, a very big one. And, and I, I like them, like everybody, I miss him very much. Huge but shock. One of my oldest, dearest friends. I've known him since I was 18. And uh, yeah, uh, and very much unfinished business. We dreamt of working together again and we're talking about it constantly. Is that right? Yeah. And he did, he did pop up in Blackadder every now and again. Yeah, and stole Blackie. the show. And yeah. nobody ever minded. Rowan was always wonderful about it. Rowan was so Ryan, which he'd, you know, he'd, oh. you could see Rose sitting there watching Rick. You know, take it home for the five minutes he was on screen. Very happy to do so. Mm -hmm. Rose, a very relaxed, cool guy. And, you know, when you've got somebody like Rick, let him go. You know, let him have it. And and I remember first, you know, I think it's probably self-evident that Flashheart as a character was something I vaguely brought to the table. And I remember Richard embracing it very quickly. Uh -huh. And the two of us having such fun writing sort of Rick-style stuff. You know, I've got a, you know, I've got an idea and it's as hot as my pants and all that, which we knew he would, he would make brilliant. Yeah. No, they were great days, happy days. Remember, still to come, we've got Keith Lemon, John Lloyd and David Mitchell. But before all that, let's take a look into the uncelebrated world of TV continuity with Tony Curry. Well, the biggest, longest gap was Christmas Eve 1984, and it was STV, it wasn't the BBC. And we were doing a watch night service from Corio's Homes and Bridge of Weir. Aye. And uh, that, was, that was a doddle because I was the announcer, and all I had to do was announce. I didn't have to do any technology in those days. And uh, it was Christmas Eve, so I'd got my jacket off and I'd got the cigars out and I was sitting in my wee continuity studio enjoying mm -hmm. the way we were. It's a lovely film with Barbara Streisand. And all I had to do was do a little um, eight-second voice over a slide saying, and now on STV, let's go to the Quarriers Homes Bridge of Weir for tonight's Watch Night service. That, that was it. Fair enough. So I'm all ready. And just <laughs> as, it's, as we're into the end credits of the film... The transmission controller comes on the top back and says, there's no watch night service. It's not going to work. You'll have, you'll have to fill. Oh. And the first agonising decision was, I only had 30 seconds. Did I have time <laughs> to put my jacket on or my makeup? Uh huh. <laughs> I hope you went for the jacket. No, I went for the makeup, Fred. Right. <laughs> I'm quite, you know me, I'm quite scary without makeup. <laughs> so I, I did the makeup. You're scarier with it, actually. Thanks. But go on. <laughs> I put the jacket and the makeup on. And I pop up on the screen and I do all the apologising bit. Uh -huh. And uh, there is a kind of a... There's a, a, a momentum with these things that it starts off, you're expecting something to happen very quickly and so all you're doing is saying, we're sorry for the loss of your programme, we're doing all we can to restore it. In the meantime, here is some music. Yes. That's what you expect to happen. But there was nothing happening and nobody was playing music and nobody was signalling to me or ringing the little telephone on my desk. And I'm just wittering on about things. And then eventually... <laughs> Uh, I thought, I've had enough of this. I've spoken for 10 minutes. Yes. Nobody's told me what's going on. So I said, we'll play you some music and I'll be back with you in a moment. At which point the transmission controller kicks open the studio door and says, gramophone's not working, the phone's not working, we don't have a standby programme, there's nowhere to go, carry on. Carry on. <laughs> and they put me back on. Uh, and <clears throat> it's Christmas Eve and I'm all on my own on television. Uh -huh. And... I I did an extraordinary thing. I started singing Christmas carols. But I was going to say, if you'd like to get your hymn books out, we'll start with Once in Royal David City. Well, I, th I, th I thought so as not to um, oh. offend any particular religious group, we would uh -huh. stick to things like Jingle Bells. Oh, and right. I, so I had the viewers singing Jingle oh, Bells. Tony. And and we went through, uh, you know, the TV papers and things. Eventually, yeah. the, the, the thing was, was fixed. Uh, well, we never actually got the pictures. We got the sound. Yeah. Well, um, and it was all because of a, a, a storm. And the next day, the transmission um, uh, was fine and the, the Christmas dinner was lovely. And I'm sitting at home and the programme controller phones me up and says, thanks for that, Tony. Thought you'd like to know the overnight uh, ratings show that you got three times the audience you would have expected for the watch night service. Because all over Scotland, people were phoning tuning in. their pals and saying, you've got to turn on the TV and watch this. <laughs> and he said, but then I don't know about the network. I said, what do you mean about the network? He said, well, uh, the whole of Britain was supposed to be watching that programme and uh, they just plugged into you. So, wow. So I'd been doing this throughout Britain. I didn't Brilliant. Know. Would you invite Keith Lemon onto a live morning radio show? Fred McCauley would. What was he thinking? So the man is here. Keith Lemon has got two books out. Uh, Little Keith Lemon, Memoirs of My Childhood. Good morning. Good morning. This book is an adult book. There's a parental um, guide advisory sticker on the front. Uh -huh. This is not for children. It's definitely not. <laughs> Do not miss it. So it looks like it could be. Little uh -huh. Keith Lemon sounds like a nice title, yes. but it's not for children. Right, okay. But this one, The Beaver and the Elephant, 
That is. is for children. And when it says the beaver and the elephant, yeah. don't think that's some innuendo like Captain Pugwash was full of. Do you know of. that never crossed my mind? Well, on Twitter, a lot of people were going, you have written a kid's book? Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, is it, what age is it suitable for? Uh-huh. For kids' age? It's for parents to read uh, bedtime stories right. to their children. Because um, I've got friends that have got kids, and they uh-huh. always tell me that it's, um, a lot of kids' books are boring. So this, uh, um, but this, what I try to do is cre- remember um, when Ant and Deck used to do Saturday morning telly. I do, yeah. How it was good for adults as well. Yeah. I tried to make a book that maybe parents will find quite humorous. That's right. And, and children will enjoy also. And they, they used to have that Cat Daly on, didn't they? Cat Daly, yeah. She, she went it. to America, didn't yeah. she? Yeah. She's famous. Over I've, there. I have met Cat Daly. You have. Cl- close up, she's got a bigger tash than me and you. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but she's very pretty with a tash. <laughs> you mean you should see me when I'm dressed as Kim Kardashian, <laughs> and I look, I, I look. Really pretty. Uh-huh. You can't see it on radio. No, but I'm going to show him. Well, we, well, I'll maybe take a photo of you before you before you head off. Or is this you dressed up as Kim Kardashian? Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah. maybe tweet it to Macaulay and Cole. Okay, then. Um, great. I'm doing um, a sketch show at the moment, which will be out early next year. Uh huh. If That's that smart. works, that is amazing. Imagine if I didn't have that tash. Yeah. You and go, it, hey, she's that a looker. Kim da- Kardashian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But with the tash, I just look. Um, what's the word? Exotic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You look, I mean, that is the look of somebody that could win Eurovision. Definitely, because that guy had a beard. That's right. Who looked a bit like Rylan uh-huh. from X Factor and now from Big Brother's bit on the side. But yeah. uh, in, in the book that's for the adults, the one that's definitely not for children, yeah. um, what, is this your life story up to well, getting I did into a book called television Being, and stuff? I did a, no, I did a book before this called um, Being Keith Fleming, and that was focusing on... I suppose my career really, uh-huh. and it, like, in TV, and this is going back. It's a prequel. Right, it goes back to growing up in Leeds, going to school, uh, my first adult experience. I know you what know you mean. Sort of yeah, thing. and um, yeah, it goes right up to in my twenties, probably. Right. And uh, and the beaver and the elephant. Have you read this to kids? Have you? Yes, I have. Yet to me, mates, and what, kids. What's the reaction been? They, they, they like it, you know. Yeah. They like it because it's a bit cheeky in respect to. Um, I, well, I did some research. Said to me, mates, what makes your kids laugh? And they go, oh, you just say poo a couple of times uh-huh. and they laugh. So there's a lot of morals in there. Like one of them is go to the toilet before you go on long journeys, and Fear the elephant comment. doesn't go. Oh, right. uh, so he does a poo in a imagine. shoe shop. Yeah. And because it's for kids, I thought I won't. I won't draw a brown poo. I no. draw a pink one shaped like. A love art, right? And but the moral there is: um, first of all, go don't go to the toilet for long journeys, uh-huh. but also don't swallow chewing gum because his poo is pink. Because he's been swallowing chewing, chewing gum, gum. <laughs> but it clogs up. It doesn't make you poo pink. It clogs up your arteries, doesn't right. it? As we know, as adults, we know that. Right. Okay. And there, and you've done the drawings. Yeah. I me. Mean, I, when I was doing through the keyhole, sometimes I was travelling for like three hours in the back of a car. Yeah. A lot of the houses were up north for some reason. I don't know why. Because I thought in telly, everyone oh. lives in London. A lot of northerners are on telly these days, which is a good thing. Um, so I would get my iPad out and I did this book. Uh-huh. Yeah. We had uh, Des O'Connor was on the show this morning. Love Des O'Connor. Because uh, he was a panellist and through the keyhole. Yeah, yeah. He said he was worried about letting you into his house. but And that's why he said, no, you're not... Right, well, you know what? Come on as a panellist. Um, I, I, you know, I have some accidents in some people's houses, but I always pay for it if I do any damage. Right. And they do. I do respect their wishes. They say, don't go in that room, uh-huh. don't go in this drawer, and I don't. Well, when I did the pilot, I think the weirdest thing I found was a Dracula mask in a brown paper bag. And um, how can I put this? Um, a lady's toy. Right, yeah, OK. Yeah. That's well put yeah, for, yeah. for a morning yeah. radio show. A lady's yeah. toy, yeah. yeah. BBC Radio Scotland has a wonderfully diverse schedule. And if you want proof, check out the editorial handbrake turn between Keith Lemon on Macaulay & Co and First Minister's Questions from Holyrood. Okay. Now we're done. Look at this. Oh, it's, is that it? it? That's it. Well, yeah. I've written... Jo- I've, it's gone so fast. That's when you enjoy uh-huh. something. It goes fast, doesn't oh, it? Oh, that's right. And it <laughs> yeah. was... We were... Bang out of time. So thank Little you Keith Lemon in uh, book, bookshops now. And the Beaver now, and the, and the, Elephant, the well. Elephant in bookshops now. Celebrity yeah. Juice Thursdays. Next week is the last one. Tonight <laughs> it's um, a muck busted special. And uh, all that it means for me to say is that <laughs> FM now it's John Beatty, medium wave from Holyrood. It's First Minister's Questions. We're back tomorrow. Till then, from all of us. Ta da. All best. <laughs> well, good afternoon. It's high noon and therefore time. David Mitchell is either a Booker shortlisted, world-respected, best-selling author or the googly-eyed funny guy from that TV programme, Peep Show. Guess which one Fred Macaulay got? When I was at school, there was a brief period, I just 
you know, looking back through the mists of unhappiness, where I was, I think I was called ratty. Ratty. Uh, not because I was irritating and not because I liked messing about in uh. boats, but because of I had a big nose and small ears. Oh, so, a wee. No, I was I was sort of medium sized. Right. But I mean I think they were having to stretch a point. I don't think I looked particularly like a rat. But they, they just wanted to be unpleasant and yeah. that was the the negative animal they you know, because rats, it's not a popular animal, is it? If no. you called, if you started calling a boy at school uh-huh. tiger, then yeah. that would that would it would it would be odd, but also it would have positive connotations. Yeah. I but, didn't know I did know somebody called Tiger. There was a Tiger Cormac, who was a bricklayer that used to live in the same housing scheme as us. Was he popular? He was popular. Yeah, there you go. If yeah. he was called Rat, yeah, then ratty, you'd th- yeah. you'd think he'd be unlikely to be popular. And then we had a hippo in our class at school and a donkey. That. Did you? I what, had a what were their nicknames? At no. the end of my road. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> There's the comedic mind uh, <laughs> n- not at rest. <laughs> but actually, here's here's a, a, a 20th century uh, thing. Um, we we only had two sort of oversized guys in the whole of our year. One was called Hippo. Another one was called Fatty. Hmm. So what you're saying is as obesity hits a larger section of the population, right. the large animal-based nicknames are going to have a lot of pressure on them. <laughs> exactly. You're going to have to know different species of hippo <laughs> to tell the, the, the different fat That's children right. apart. Right. There was rhino as well, yeah. th- thick-skinned. Whereas <laughs> nicknames like Whippet are going unused. <laughs> No, that'll be it. Whip it will be used because there's only one skinny guy in the class. <laughs> yeah, that's the one with just a small paunch. <laughs> uh, did, did the rest of your face catch up with your nose, David, and did your ears catch up with the rest of your face? No, I still have very small ears. Do you? Yeah. Well, uh, but there I'm, you go. It's all right because apparently men's ears continue growing their whole oh, lives. Right. You see old men with very large ears, so... Yeah. By that point, if I'm, you know, if I'm still alive when I'm 80, mm-hmm. my ears may be medium-sized. <laughs> OK. Uh, let's talk about the book, for that is why you're with us today. But I also mm-hmm. want to know about, uh, well, not the demise, but, I mean, it's coming to an end. The Peep Show, I think you're going to be recording Series 9 in the new year. But uh, this is, uh, am I right in saying, uh, and it's, uh, all of your, or some of your favourite columns from uh, Observer, plus a wee bit more? Yeah, yes, exactly. It's a, a collection of, of the columns from the Observer that I thought were best mm-hmm. and uh, some extra stuff I've written to link it together and draw conclusions about the, you know, how the world has changed in the six years I've been uh, you know, trying to opine uh-huh. amusingly about it. Um, six years is maybe too narrow a margin to see any great changes, but what, what do you think has occurred in that time? Well, well, what interested me is I started, I coincidentally started writing columns in the autumn of 2008 when the the sort of f- most frightening part of the credit crunch was mm-hmm. happening, you know, the Lehman Brothers RBS, are oh, the cash points going to stop working thing, which was a real I mean, it was a, it was a very frightening time, and uh, and I do think that that it sort of changed the national mood, and I think I think we've become a more bad-tempered country as a result of that horrible shock. Because it really was a horrible... Sh- there was no reason for it. It was no, like, a, a crop had failed or, mm-hmm. or a building had exploded or a war had started. It just sort of came from nowhere. It was just about, you know, financial services people uh, screwing up their own calculations, uh, which seemed a, a very random and unfair reason for everyone to suddenly get frightened and poor. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think it's. I think we're in a different. I do think we're in a different era of um, mm. of uh, national mood from wh- where we were in two thousand five, six, seven. See, I, I, well, I think yes, it, it started before two thousand and eight. My own personal opinion, David, is that it began with Bob Geldof and Bono, uh, who came to Scotland uh, to try and make poverty history, and regrettably made it popular. <laughs> But And what I'd love to do is I'd love to know how many books that have been published since 2008 by people, economists, who saw it coming. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I, no, it was, yes, exactly. It's, it's, uh, it's all very well to say you saw it coming afterwards. <laughs> it's like the, when, you know, Darren ba- Brown predicted the lottery numbers uh-huh. by saying, yes, afterwards, yes, I predicted them. <laughs> we had uh, Lee Mack on the, the show last week. Me, Lee's out on tour, and I saw uh, about... 60% of his stand-up gig on Friday night, um, and it, he's, he's brilliant. I've always been a big fan of Lee's on stage, and people 
And you're probably the same. People will mm. say, and who makes you laugh? But Lee has always made me laugh. Yes, yeah. From working with him back in the, the he's comedy also store days. the quickest person oh. I know. It's, yeah. you know, frightening. Yep. And I, I said to him that there had been a great... Um, well, they're all good, but there was a Would I Lie to You recently with Ed Byrne and Miles Jupp and uh, Lee and, and yourself, obviously, and just in great form. And there must be some... Archive footage in the BBC of of stuff that you know just too much material to get broadcast. Do, do, they, do they bring it out in DVD like Mock the Week does? I don't know if they do. But they should. I'm, yeah, I'm not aware of having received a check for it. Oh, no, 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 that's so. the, that'd be right down at the bottom of the contract. <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, I mean, what I like to you is the you know it's the most fun thing to do. It really, it really doesn't feel like work at all, uh-huh. and. Um, we we sort of we just play a jolly parlor game for uh, a couple of hours and uh, I'm I'm feel very lucky to be in the you know to to have been plonked in the middle of that uh-huh. format and to work with Rob and Lee who are you know who are brilliant and um, it, we 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 generally we genuinely really enjoy it and people will ask you as they ask me you know how much preparation goes into some of these shows you know the, the one that I've done with the least preparation would be QI. Then have I got news for you? Minimal, mm-hmm. mock the week, tedium. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that would I lie to you is up there with QI, where there's there's little or no preparation goes into it. Yeah, there, there's none. And, and Perfect. Which, it, which what is a great TV no, gig. Well, exactly, and it's brilliant because the the, the format wouldn't work if people prepared. That if you know what's going to be on the card, it's it's not the same. You you want people to be, uh, un, you know, unready for questioning, or you know, that's how you can tell the difference between the truth and, uh, and a lie. Although uh-huh. you can't actually, I've I've found over the years. But so so yes, it's not not just no preparation necessary, but no preparation is mandatory. <laughs> brilliant. So you know, I feel I feel like I, I'm paid for the time I'm not preparing. <laughs> Just turn up, bring a new shirt, and uh, something <laughs> yes. that's camera friendly. So peep show coming to an end, um, but I, I suppose everything has a natural uh, lifespan. Would, would you think it's about right? Yes, I do, um, and uh, you know, I think. Um, it, it was, you know, it started off as about two uh, blokes sharing a flat in their twenties, uh-huh. um, and you know, with the characters we are like a couple of years younger than we are, uh, so it's still two blokes sharing a flat in their thirties. But I don't think uh, we want it to become a sitcom about two blokes sharing mm-hmm. a flat in their forties because it's <laughs> that's just different. It, it it begs different questions. Um, so um, yeah, I, th- I think it's uh, I think it's right that it should end, and also I'm very glad we're being given the opportunity to say we're ending it in advance and uh-huh. sort of go down with uh, uh, you know with a bit of dignity and hopefully with a great series. <laughs> it, it was becoming the, what the odd couple, the prequel. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Um, well, Sam and Jesse, who, who write people, wrote a great sitcom called uh, The Old Guys that yes. was on BBC One, and yes, uh, we were in danger of joining up with it. <laughs> Um, am I right in saying, David, that you're going to be doing a, a, a bit of a book tour? Yes. I, well, I'm, I'm dotting around um, largely the south of England. Right. Um, and that was not my choice. That's just the way it's worked out. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, so I, I feel guilty about that, even though it's not my fault. So what sort of a guy does that make me? <laughs> I can feel guilt about things that aren't my fault. Mm-hmm. That's, I'm, I'm like some kind of saint. And you've got absolutely no say in where you go. Well, no, well, what I have not done is involved myself in organising it, I suppose. <laughs> That's so. dreadfully honest of you, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I wish you all the very best with the book. Uh, and I, I suspect that you're somebody that will very much enjoy um, the sort of freedom of standing on stage. You know, you've, you've got the book as the anchor, as it were, but, you know, when you're, you've got people on board who are in there because they're fans... It'll be great fun, I think, just to chat to them. And will, will you do a sort of Q&A? Yes, exactly. And, and yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. And, uh, yes, yeah, so what I'm saying is it, it, what, I'm, what I think about it is that, if you know, I'm, a, I'm allowed to try and be funny, but also I've got a, a book to read from and, and fall back on. So, uh, you know, I don't... Uh, it's, it's like a sort of dipping my toe into the waters of performing on my own uh-huh. in front of live people, but without it being a, a, a proper show. And if you, if you like that feeling, might we see you doing more than that? In that regard? Well, I don't know. I think I've spent my whole career wondering whether I'm going to do stand-up. Uh-huh. And I'm still wondering. So, you know, I haven't stopped wondering. Uh-huh. So, you know, maybe I will. Well, but also- you can't die wondering, David, as my old Aunt Jeanette said <laughs> in her late 70s. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's yes, that's, that's excellent advice. <laughs> and, and she she said she wouldn't die wondering. She was a spinster, but she she, she said that was her mantra at family get-togethers. Right. Did you never fancy getting married, Aunt Jeanette? No, but I won't die wondering. <laughs> We're in the last 20 minutes of the programme. It's Friday, it's the end of the week, so the weekend has already started as far as some of us are concerned. We now need to wrap things up with the five things we didn't know this time last week. Joining me, a man who's been all over the Scottish television uh, airwaves the last couple of weeks, Chris Forbes. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Fred. What's the name of your cop in, co- uh, in Scott Squad? It's PC Charlie McIntosh. Charlie McIntosh. Yeah. He's a nice chap, isn't he? Good old C-Mac. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Has he ever encountered anything really troublesome? Not, not so far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great character, yeah. Uh, and uh, down in our London studio, uh, a welcome back to the program. First time he's done five things for us, and uh, delighted you can join us, John Lloyd. Good morning, Fred. Oh, now, John, I mean, this is, you know, you're, you're Premier League. We're we're playing second <laughs> okay. division here, but uh, we've, we've got a number of stories to get to, and we're going to go straight to the first headline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good one. Yes, I. This is uh, the news story that I think most people have heard about now about uh, the two effigies of the Scottish First Minister uh, and uh, Loch Ness Monster um, being uh, withdrawn from celebrations in Lewis and uh, South Essex after uh, quite a big protest and social media storm right. online. So the police are investigating uh, these complaints now. Um, but I'd like to know the breakdown of the calls, like the complaints, how many were actually complaining about Salmon and how many were complaining about Nessie. You know, there might have been more people <laughs> concerned right. for the Loch Ness Monster, we, we don't uh-huh. know. And uh, a lot of people have been pointing out that um, there's certainly plenty of other, especially within politics, figures that they could have chosen to burn that people have been suggesting all sorts on social media and Nigel Farage, but I think he's quite a lean character. I think quite possibly they were just looking for quite a plump politician so that the fire <laughs> would last for a long time. So it could be fairly innocent. We don't fully know. The, was this story covered down south much, John? Uh, yes, it was, and um, uh, in quite some detail, actually, because they've been doing this for years and years. And one of the people on Twitter said, can you imagine how much complaints there'd be if they burned David Cameron? But actually, they did burn David Cameron in 2010. <laughs> Nobody noticed. <laughs> Nobody noticed. And uh, it's, it's interesting because they, they actually did, uh, despite the police uh, warning them not to, they burned, the, I think, the one of um, Alex Salmon in a kilt, which is, very, is a really funny puppet, actually. Uh-huh. But, uh, they, and, and apparently Roman candles shot flames out of his nipples. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's, uh, it's it quite gonna... a send-off, really. Oh, I mean, it's well, I think it, in a way it's quite life. an honour, isn't it? It's like when we used to do Spitting Image, uh-huh. not to be on the, the list would be a, it was a disaster, you yeah. know. So it's quite a flattering thing, really. I don't know where is Lu- uh, in fact, how is it pronounced? Lewis or Lewis? Lewis, Lewis, yeah. right? Because when I first heard it was Lewis, I thought it was going to be uh, the Outer Hebrides, and I thought that's a bit <laughs> extreme, even up, <laughs> for up there. Uh, on to the next headline for John Lloyd. Have a listen to this, John. The Republicans. Ah, <laughs> oh, the Republicans. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I think this is about the um, the Republicans taking control of both the chambers of Congress in America. Absolutely. Uh, which is the first time they've managed this since two thousand and six. And there's a bloke um, who's going to be the majority leader. He was a minority leader in the Senate. Who's uh, because the, the Republicans have got a uh, got a majority. A bloke from Kentucky called Mitch McConnell. Uh huh. Who really doesn't like Obama? He uh, he said um, he was interviewed in a in a mag called Politico. Uh, he sounds like a bit of a tough character. Uh, it said of him, while most politicians desperately want to be liked, McConnell has relished and cultivated his reputation as a villain. Villain. <laughs> so he's obviously out to get him. And there's another guy, the Speaker of the House, the, the of um, the House of Representatives, a guy called John Boner. Mm-hmm who said Obama was playing with matches and will burn himself. <laughs> so maybe maybe uh, the people at Lewis can, uh, can help out. <laughs> yeah, we do. We've got the prospect of a lame duck president for, for two years, Obama. But I was talking to one of the journalists on the Today programme uh, a couple of months ago who said that he had met both George W. Bush and Obama, and the guy he really liked was Bush. 
He said he was very, very charming in person mm. and really concerned about you, really listened. Uh -huh. And he said the interesting thing at Obama, in, in person, he's actually he's one of those people who thinks he knows everything. He thinks he's right all the time. Mm. He's actually quite a difficult person to negotiate with, which is interesting, isn't it? Because it's not what you'd expect. It could be that George W. Bush is just one of these people, John, that has the same expression on his face when he appears to be listening <laughs> as not knowing what's going on, you know? He might just be staring at you thinking, no, none of this is going to end. <laughs> but he, but people, he looks very wise. But just yeah. nod now and again with that look. It's, it's, <laughs> nodding. It's, it's what I do. OK, it is, of course, President Obama, uh, not our president, their president, who might only have uh, two years not doing very much as the lame duck president. Chris, third headline. Arachnophob here! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this isn't a nice a new story for any arachnophobes, uh, spider hairs. This will be about uh, Katie Mellow, uh, or, mm -hmm. Kate, or Katie Melba Toast, as my dad used to call her, because he <laughs> loved Melba Toast, uh, who actually uh, had to have a live spider removed from her ear. Who does she think she is? Ozzy Osbourne? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's crazy. Uh, she said that uh, it must have got into. She wears these kind of old-fashioned earbud headphones that block out sound when she's on a on uh -huh. a flight. Uh, and I know what they're like because I have some for whenever Katie Mellow comes on the radio. <laughs> uh, and the spider must have crawled in. Well, she put them on and it went right into her ear. And uh -huh. It stayed living. I don't know what that says about the state of her ears, if they were either oh. very clear so it was easy to thrive or if they were... Uh -huh full of wax and, and, and full of stuff to feed on to keep the spider living. I don't know what that says about her ears. But uh, they were able to, to restrict this tiny little spider right. and it was still alive. And uh, I love this because my sister's a massive arachnophobe to the extent where she goes out and collects conkers in the autumn time because right. apparently spiders don't like the scent or something that conkers give off. And so she puts them around the house, like in all corners <laughs> of every room, right. bathroom, kitchen. So I like the thought now that uh -huh. she's going to bed and she'll have heard this story and she's got conkers in her ears now, you know. <laughs> it, it is frightening to think uh, that that's uh, happened. The the more frightening thing might be she'll write a song about it. Yeah, it'll be some sort of whimsical... Uh, kind of nine twee, billion the, the, spiders in yeah, the ears. <laughs> the rear whisperers of, of the uh -huh. spider. and It'll be ridiculous. <laughs> what could a spider live off in your ear? You know... Potatoes, is, is, my is granddad say, you know. Although this is going to disgust people that are, are and I, I'm loath to tell it, but what the heck? I actually saw somebody when I was sitting in the car about two weeks ago. There was a guy, and he, he had his pinky in his ear, and he was giving it that, you know, oh, the, yeah, yeah. Oh. and uh, he extracted his pinky and he looked at oh, the pinky to see what was on, he didn't. and then popped it in his mouth. Oh. And I was thinking, no. yeah, but and I was thinking. What on earth was he looking at it first for? Was he going to think, well, if this looks disgusting, there's no way I'm going to eat it. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> but do you not always have a look if you rub your ear? No. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh too whoa, much. Whoa. <laughs> Need to be.